Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Chad. I'm the pastor of this church. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I just want to emphasize that we hope you'll come out to Suco on Friday and Saturday. Uh, whether you can come out to part of it or all of it, that would be great. It is an incredible celebration full of symbols. Uh, we would, if you're wondering why did they plan this in October, uh, it's not like we picked it. Uh, the Jewish people have been celebrating it in, in the same, on the same schedule for uh, thousands of years. And so uh, it's, it would be like changing Easter and just being like, yeah, we like the weather, weather better when it's later in April. And so you can't just change Sukkot. So that's why we're doing it at the end of October. Uh, this morning we finished a series of sermons on how much we matter and why we matter according to the Bible. Next week we'll start a new series uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually a continuation of an old series. Last year we did Matthew chapter 5, which is like the first third of the Sermon on the Mount, this incredible uh, sermon delivered by Jesus. And this year we'll do Matthew chapter 6, which is like the second third of, of that incredible sermon. And, and maybe we'll do Matthew chapter 7 next year. I don't know. Uh, but I hope you'll be here next week for that. But I'm excited to finish with you today because we finish in, in a place in this series that, uh, that's near and dear to my heart because uh, the experience of what I'm going to talk about is pretty much what changed my life forever. My life was radically changed the day that I came to understand a little bit more how infinite God's love is for us. I think that what, what changed me ultimately to understand that I matter was, was the moment when I came to realize that Jesus had died for me, and I was, I am, an incredible sinner. You've heard me tell this story before, but I felt the need to confess some, some things to, to a person, and, and I confessed those things, and it was no big deal, whatever. We just moved on, not, not really a thing in my memory. But that night, night when I got home, it was as if God just whispered in my ear, like, you don't need to confess anything to any person. You need to confess to me. And, and, and I told God uh, how much of a sinner I was. And, and I think it was the first time, even though I'd grown up in a Christian home, even though I had called myself a Christian for 13 years, I, I, even though I, I kind of tried to live, you know, a godly life in some ways, it was the first time where I really just pondered how many things I do wrong how many things I do that are bad and, and then out of that the more important part was to realize how much love it must have taken for Jesus to be willing to suffer the punishment for all of those sins and that's what we believe as Christians that's what I believed before that moment that Jesus had died for all my sins and, and in some ways I had dismissed that as like that's kind of cool you know but in that single moment it went from kind of cool to this life-changing truth and one of the things that radically changed about me that day is I became a person who realized how much I mattered. If Jesus was willing to sacrifice for every little tiny thing I had done wrong and even more for all of the big things that I have done wrong, then how much must he think that I matter? We've seen in this series that, that we matter because we were made, and we've seen that we, we kind of know how much we matter because uh, the, our maker, God, he pays attention to us and he takes care of us, and that's pretty incredible. But at the heart of all of that is this thing that I think we are going to see today in Romans chapter 5, and that is that the reason that God cares for us, the reason that God pays attention to us, and it's simply this, God loves us, he loves you. And, and if I have, you know, one truth that I want you to walk away with today, it's that you matter because God loves you. You matter because God loves you. And I know that for many, while they may not voice this audibly, there's this thought that comes with that. And, and, and you, you might believe even, like, yeah, God loves everybody, you know, kind of generalize that theory, God loves everybody. But there's this question, does God really love me? Does God really, really love me? Now you may believe that God loves you again in some theoretical sense, but like does God really, you know, really, really love you? Does God like you? And, and what we're going to look at in Romans 5, 6 through 8 today is going to answer this question with an emphatic yes. God does love you and you matter because 
God loves you. But before we get to our passage, I want to read what, what lies before it. I want to read Romans 5, 1, 2, and 5. I know that's kind of weird. You can read the rest. I'm not trying to hide something or anything like that, but it just made the most sense for what I want to focus on in this section. But Romans 5, 1, 2, and 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of glory. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I mean, in those three verses right there, there's like 50 things, like 100 things that we could talk about. And it would take no preparation. You can go home and read those verses tonight and and you could probably spend all day thinking about the implications of the things in those verses. They're weighty, they're heavy, they're awesome. But I want to point out two things. The first is that Paul says we boast in the hope of glory. And, and this hope of glory comes from the love of God. I, I think this is important to point out today because I'm convinced. And as I, as I thought about this passage and kind of finishing up this series, I thought it would be good to, to tell you what I'm convinced of. And that's simply this. We often boast about the things that we believe make us matter. We boast about the things that we think gives our life meaning, gives us purpose, makes us meaningful as individuals. Uh, If it's some skill you have, you might find that you talk about that skill a lot. You're really good at something, you talk about being really good at that thing, or at least you talk about that thing a lot, because in some ways, that's connected in your brain or in your heart to mattering. I matter because I'm really good at fill in the blank. I'm really good at this thing. Uh, It it might be that other people like you and maybe you've spent your life trying to feel like you matter by by causing other people to like you and you're scared somewhere deep down inside. You're scared that people won't like you or that you'll offend people or that you'll bother people because in your head you've you've connected being liked to, to mattering, to really and genuinely mattering you know you don't have to look much past high school to see all these things that people kind of uh they think makes them matter like whether they're good at a sport or whether they're well liked or whether they're good looking or whether they got the right girl or whether they drive the right car and and while we don't see it so clearly in adults a lot of that same stuff just continues through our lives we think we matter because we got the promotion or we think we matter because we live in the nice house or we think we matter because we, we are able to look like we matter on social media or or whatever it might be we we think we matter often because of things that we've been able to achieve or that we're naturally good at. And we talked about in this series how that's, that's a scary way to live our lives. But as Paul talks about boasting here, I'm just reminded that often the things that, that we try to gain our value from are things that we end up boasting about. And for Paul, he says, here's the thing that we ought to boast about, that we have the hope of glory, that we get to look forward to heaven, because of God's love for us. The thing that Paul understood is that he mattered in large part, he mattered primarily because of God's love for him. In fact, in other places, Paul, Paul lists his credentials because people are questioning whether or not you know, he's good enough to be an apostle of Jesus. And so he gives these lists of all the things that he's suffered and all of the things that he's done. And, and then he, he, he just stops and says, you know, but I consider it all trash. Uh, I consider it all garbage, rubbish, uh, compared to knowing Christ and to knowing the love that he has for me. Paul was a, he was, uh, he wrote Romans, by the way, I should tell you that, but he was a, an up-and-coming big shot, intelligent, that's clear in the way he writes, and moving forward in religious circles, well-educated, born into the right kind of home. I mean, he had a, a hundred things going for him that he could have said, well, this is why I matter. But after, after he encountered Jesus, he realized that the only thing that truly made him matter was that God had created him and despite his sin had loved him. And Paul says the thing that he boasts about is the hope of glory, that he gets to spend eternity with God because the love of the love God has had for him. The second thing I want you to notice is this, is this great thing about uh, God's love being poured into our hearts. I think what we've kind of seen in this series so far is um, 
I could connect it to my Chemex here. Uh, this is a Chemex. It, it, you're going, what is it's Chad smoking? You know, um, this is this is a, a coffee making device, I guess. And and you may not realize that you're like Chad can talk about weed today, but uh, but no, this is a coffee making device right here. Uh, you put your filter on the top, and then you basically make a pour over. I used to use it every day for making coffee until my wife's stomach no longer allowed her to have coffee. I know, feel so sorry for it. It's a horrible thing, uh, and so I don't use it. It every day anymore, but but uh, Chemexes are cool just because of how they look, right? They they were created uniquely. They're created uh, in, in, I think, a very creative, beautiful way. I think that it looks good. We keep it out all the time. We don't hide it in a cupboard. It looks awesome. Uh, it's very popular among hipsters because I think it just looks, you know, better than your coffee maker that you have at home, uh, and it makes a good cup of coffee. And, and, and as I was thinking about what Paul says here, I think so far in this series, we've kind of talked about us like this like we matter because we're creatively made we matter because God thinks highly of us because God wants to put us on his shelf and and he pays attention to us we're not relegated to the back of the junk drawer you know God really looks at us and he says wow this is good and and we said in the first series that when God created he he looked at humanity and said this is very good this is you are the very in very good as the creation of God But what now we see in this passage of scripture that we're going to look at and what Paul alludes to right here at the beginning is is that God's love has been poured into our hearts. It's like like when the Chemex gets coffee, right? It goes from being a really great design that matters, just standalone, to now fulfilling its actual purpose And, and, and frankly taking on more meaning and more value and more worth because it's now filled with the very thing it was created to be filled with and what happened in in the story of humanity is that we were created and and just in creation whether you're a Christian or not you absolutely matter but when Jesus showed up on the scene he said I'm going to fill you with the very thing you were designed to be filled with I'm going to fill you with my love And so right at the beginning here, Paul kind of alludes to this idea, like, look, hey, you matter. You matter. But now you can grasp the the fullness of mattering and how much you matter because the love of God has been poured into your hearts. You see, we we all matter. You matter. Uh, But something happened when people started sinning. When you sinned, you diminished some of, of the meaning of your life. You diminished your purpose. We have diminished our purpose, the very thing we were created for. And Jesus came to die on a cross so that we might be replenished. We might once again live out all the fullness of what it means to matter. And then, and then Paul in the verse six and seven and eight He's like, here's your proof, because you might ask that question, but what about me? You know, I mean, yeah, sure, I'm a Kim X, I'm, I'm great, like I was well made, we're creative, humanity's pretty cool, right? I mean, it's amazing how we breathe even, you know, it's pretty, a pretty incredible thing. But does God really, does he really love me enough to infuse me with his love? And here's what Paul says in Romans 5, 6, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly powerless is a powerful word Uh, other translations not the NIV I think give it uh, a fuller meaning and and together I think they give us a great picture the English standard version says weak and the NASB says helpless and the KJV King James version says without strength John MacArthur says it's used in a general sense to describe people who are simply deficient in some way Their deficiency may be a lack of education, opportunities, or finances, or perhaps a physical problem. Uh, Think about that for a second, because isn't that what makes you feel less like you matter? Uh, There's parts of your life where you're weak. I don't know what those, they're different for all of us, right? All of us have deficiencies. We don't like to talk about those deficiencies, but all of us have those deficiencies. And, And we don't like them about ourselves. And for a lot of people, those deficiencies become the sole focus. If I was just better at this, if I just looked more like that, if I could just accomplish this, then I would really feel like I matter. 
And Paul says, while you were still, while you were still weak, while you still had deficiencies, God, Christ, died for you. Charles Spurgeon says, I have no doubt the apostle had in his eye the description of the helpless infant given by the prophet Ezekiel. It was an infant, an infant newly born, an infant deserted by its mother before the necessary offices of tenderness had been performed, left unwashed, unclothed, unfed, a prey to certain death under the most painful circumstances, forlorn, abandoned, hopeless. And in that state, Christ died for you. We can all connect to being weak in some ways, but here it specifically means while we were helpless to do anything about our sin. We were totally weak. We could not break free from the power of sin. We could not break free from the punishment of sin. We could not break free from the death that sin surely will bring us. And while we were in that lowly state, Christ died for us. You, you can know that you matter because God loves you, but you can know that God loves you because while you were still helpless and without strength, before you could do anything cool or awesome, before you were on God's, God's side, while you were still powerless, Christ chose to die for you. You could not earn it. You could not live up to some expectation and gain it, but Christ loved you enough to die for you. But there's more. He even says that he died for, he doesn't say you, if you were paying attention. He says for the ungodly, those without God, those on the opposite side of God. And I think that some people don't become Christians, not because they don't believe in this Christian stuff, but because they think that they've been too godless to be embraced or filled up by the love of Christ. I think some people simply grow up in godless homes and they think, well, that God thing's not for me. And Christ died for you while you were in that state. I think some people, they look at their lives and they say, I've done too many things that I know God doesn't want me to do and there's too much guilt inside of me and there is no way because of these things that God could love me. No person could love me for crying out loud if they knew the things that I had done. How could God love me? And here Paul says, Christ died for you while you were in that state. I think some people make a life of, of being God rejectors. They've, they've told everyone while they're, why they're an atheist or an agnostic and they've, they've said mean things about God. They've rejected him. They've used his name in vain and they think there's no way I can turn around and go the other direction now. But while you were still in that state, Christ died for you and it demonstrates that he loves you and his love shows that you matter. And then Paul continues, and, and man, this next analogy is so simple but so beautiful at the same time. It says in Romans 5, 7, and 8, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The meaning of this statement is, is really simple. Uh, Paul writes it in a really complicated, weird way that leaves people debating on exactly how he was nuancing this thing. But, but basically it's this. People might die for a righteous person, somebody that they know to be good. Or even more, they might die for somebody that they deem to be good, somebody they like, basically. That's how I, what I think Paul's kind of what he's separating here is, is, is you might die for somebody you know to be morally good and, and, and you have a you know, better chance of dying for somebody that you like, but rarely will somebody die, but rarely will somebody dare to die for somebody who's not a good person, who they don't like. But Jesus, he demonstrates his own love for you and I in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us he died for the most evil vile worst people in history but what's even more amazing to me and always will be more amazing to me is that he died for me this sinner it doesn't emotionally connect that christ would die for hitler but it does emotionally connect that christ would die for me because I know the things that I've thought, I know the things that I've said, and I know the things that I've done. And if you knew them all, you'd say, how can this guy be a pastor? But in the middle of that state, Christ died for 
me, a wretched and helpless sinner. He died for us who were, and this is all of us, helpless. He died for us who were ungodly and he died for us who were sinners. And it demonstrates this incredible truth. Well, he did it because of this incredible truth, but it also demonstrates this incredible truth that you are loved by God no matter what you have done or who you have been. And this, this means that you matter. What's incredible to see throughout the history of of Christianity is that Christians have have seen this uh, love of Christ. They've experienced this love of Christ. And, 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 And then they... They demonstrate it to other people. And I know right now in our current culture, Christianity gets a bad name. And I, I think it's because, uh, you know, we're politically different maybe than, than society. Or, uh, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> Christians that get on TV that don't represent us very well. And there's a lot of fraudulent Christians that become famous. But what, what our society neglects is that for 2,000 years, Christians have been the most sacrificial group of people on earth. And they've been willing to sacrifice for people that were their enemies because they look at Jesus and they say, Jesus did it. And if I'm truly going to be a follower of Jesus, then I'm going to do it too. I mean, you don't have to look very far to find examples of this, but, but, I, but I thought of Hacksaw Ridge, and, and if you know the story or have seen the movie, it's, I mean, the story is simply of a guy who, who refused to fight because of his faith, and, and not every Christian agrees with that, but what makes the story staggering is that he just kept saving people's lives while he was up on Hacksaw Ridge, risking his own life to do it, at one point saving an enemy soldier. And the reason is simply because he understood that while people were still sinners, Christ had died for them. And, and if Christ was willing to die for all kinds of people that had rejected God all out, then as a follower of Jesus, it would make sense that we would be willing to die for any type of person, even if they're not on our side, if they're not Christians, if they're our enemies, no matter what, we see them as mattering. And we wanna demonstrate our love to them because we see that Jesus did it first. Christians have been doing it forever. Christians have been doing it forever because our Christ is an example and he demonstrated his love to all people all people by dying for their sins in Romans 5 10 it even takes it a step further if you were to pass our passage go a couple verses down and and I think that the understanding is is how we understand this is even brought out more fully in Romans 5 10 it says for if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through faith the first thing I'd have you notice there is that it takes it a step forward like oh he died for sinners and he died for the ungodly and he, he you know he died for me but but he even I mean he died for the enemies his enemies God died for the people who are his enemies and I'll tell you if you're a person who's been an enemy of God in any way whatever that means you still need to understand that you matter because Christ loved you enough to die for you that's an incredible truth but it tells us why in verse 10 too it says so that we could be reconciled to God Man, the story of the Bible is a giant reconciliation story. It's the story in large part of of God saying, I still want to have a relationship with people. I still want to have a relationship with you even though you have totally and utterly rejected me. That's an incredible story that says we matter, right? I, I would guess that all of you, most of you anyway, have some person in your life that has wronged you in some way, that has done something against you, maybe done something so many times against you that you in your head or maybe with your words have just said, it's not worth it anymore. There's no way I'm seeking reconciliation again. You know what you've declared? And this sermon isn't even about that, but what you've declared is that my relationship to that person does not matter enough for me to seek reconciliation one more time. You've said in your heart or with your words, that person doesn't matter enough to me to seek reconciliation. 
And what the death of Christ says is that no matter how many times you've sinned against God, no matter how many bad things you've done, no matter how many times you've rejected the calling of God in your life, God still looked down at you and said, you matter enough that I will do everything that I need to do to be reconciled to you, to be brought back into a right relationship with you, a relationship that will last for eternity. Christ died for the weak, the ungodly, the sinner, and God's enemies. And this means that you matter deeply and profoundly. C.E.B. Cranefield, an author, I feel like you're a big deal if you drop three initials in there, but C.E.B. Cranefield says, he did not wait for us to start helping ourselves, but died for us when we were all together helpless. And what that says is that you mattered to God before you did anything to earn mattering to God. Charles Spurgeon says, Christ did not die because men were good or would be good, but, God, but died for them as ungodly. Or in other words, he came to seek and save that which was lost. That's you and that's me. And I wanted to stop and, and we'll celebrate this in communion in a minute, but I want to think about what that death looked like. I mean, because we would be amiss if we didn't think about what an incredible sacrifice it was. Maybe you're like me and you, you kind of generalize this like, yeah, great, Jesus loves me, he died for me. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but when we pause to really think about the sacrifice that he made, it speaks volumes to how much we matter to him and how much he loves us. Consider that Christ dwelled in heaven with his heavenly father, living in a state of perfection. He sat in perfection, looking down at humanity and thinking, I wish I could be reconciled to them. Why? First of all, that's crazy. But instead of just saying, well, I guess it didn't work out. They sinned against me. Jesus chose to come down to earth. You know the Christmas story. He was born to a virgin. And I'm always amazed, almost more amazed sometimes by the death of, uh, by the life of Jesus than the death of Jesus because I've never experienced death. Uh, but I have experienced life and I know all of the stresses and all of the pains and all of the struggles. I know what it feels like to mourn the death of a loved one. And Jesus came out of the perfection of heaven on to this planet. And he lived through all of the things that you live through. There is no temptation that is not common to man. There is nothing that you can go through that Jesus did not struggle with too. And he went through all of that for you. He he grew up on this earth and while he was growing up, he was able to remain sinless. He never did anything that was against the will of God. That's amazing. And I think about Jesus growing up, and, and I, I used to say this to my, when I was a youth pastor to youth groups, but man, I just think about Jesus going through middle school, and I think, man, I can't connect with the stuff he suffered on the cross, but wow, I would not go through middle school for anybody. And he went through middle school for you, and he grew up, and then, and then he started to give his life to ministry at about the age of 30. And, and he walked around the earth being homeless and having religious leaders tell him how evil and bad he was, being rejected by people that he came to save. And he did all of that because of his love for you. But where the story really gets great is at the end of that life. He marches into Jerusalem, a city where where his disciples know he's probably going to be killed. And he marches into the city knowing that he's going to suffer and die there for your sins. He's so in anguish over it that the Bible says he sweated drops of blood. He knew it wasn't going to be an easy task. He was not surprised by the sacrifice that he made for you. He allows for himself to be arrested despite knowing that he could call down a legion of angels and be freed. And then he is beaten, put on trial, beaten some more, sentenced to death, but scourged, whipped in the meantime. 
They place a crown of thorns on his head so that drops of blood spill down. They walk by and they're totally cold to what he is experiencing, mocking him. And the part that gets me emotional is that people are gambling for his clothing while he's hanging on a cross because he's nailed to a cross. And he dies. And when Paul says, Christ demonstrated his love for you and me in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He's talking about that sacrifice. If you ever question how much you matter, just go read about what Jesus did on the cross. You can read that at, any, uh, at the end of any of the books that we call the Gospels. Because that story says God loved you so much, even while you were still a sinner, even while you were still his enemy, even while you were ungodly, he loved you so much, and he thought you mattered so greatly that he was willing to sacrifice everything for you. But there's something you need to do. In John 3, 16, you know it, for God so loved the world He loved each and every one of us so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We must place our belief in Jesus. You see what happens is that if if we're the Kimex here, God's love was poured out on the cross but we can choose to reject that love and I think if you choose to reject that love then you'll never be filled in such a way that you can fully grasp how much you truly matter. You'll never grasp it fully until you grasp the love of God because while you'll still matter, you'll still be an important creation of God that he looks down upon, that he cares for, that he feeds, that he helps. You'll never know the greatest part of the story and that is that God wants to be reconciled to you and he poured out his love for you while he poured out his blood on the cross. And we must, I'm telling you, we must. If we're gonna understand how much we matter, then we must embrace that love by believing in Jesus. What does believing mean? Well, it means you believe that it's true. It means that you you say, yeah, I, I think I'm a sinner and I think that Jesus really is the savior. But then it means that we give our lives to him because the demons believe that. But the difference between us and demons is that we would say, Jesus, because of that, I will embrace you As my Lord and Savior, I will give my life to you. It's transactional. Jesus gave his life for you. And if you want to experience the incredible love that he offers, you must give your life to him. That's how it works. And if you do, then you will understand. You will begin to understand how incredibly much you matter. If you're not a Christian, man, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I mean, maybe you're like me, you grew up, you think it's, yeah, God's stuff's great, but like really give him your life. Really, really give him your life. And if you are a Christian, don't ever, how dare you actually? How dare you ever think that you don't matter when you've come to believe such an incredible story about how much you do matter, not because of you, not because of what you have done, but because of the ridiculously amazing grace of God who poured out his love into your hearts through the cross of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. You matter because God loves you. And so embrace that love, maybe for the first time or maybe for the millionth time, embrace that love. And let it fill you up. And let it always remind you that you matter because God created you, cares for you, watches over you, and died for you. Let me pray you'll do that. Lord Jesus, I know I stand in front of people this morning that, um, that sometimes question whether or not they really matter. And God, I've made this, you know, this series so many times I've brought up, Lord, uh, (laughs) just how achievement-based we can be in our country 
And God, I've brought up several times how much of an impact our parents can have on us when it comes to, you know, us sensing our value, understanding our value or not. Lord, I think when it comes to this topic that there's a lot to overcome just within our own hearts and our own souls. And I know there are people in front of me, God, who really don't most of the time feel like they truly matter. And I pray today, Lord, that they would be convicted for the first time or reminded for, you know, the hundredth time, God, whatever it takes, that they matter because you love them. And you have not chosen to love us, God, because we are awesome. You've chosen to love us because you are awesome and you are gracious and you are good. And Lord, I think our world gets that so backwards. We think that we matter if we can achieve, but really we matter because, God, of what you have done and who you are and how you've created us. And I pray that you would convict us of that this morning. You would encourage us with that, God. I pray that no person, God, that sits in front of me, no person who listens online would not understand that they matter because you chose to die for them. I pray that every person, God, who hears this sermon would give their lives to you if they haven't already. And I pray for every Christian, God, that already has embraced you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that you would place in them a great understanding of how much they matter because of, uh, and how much purpose they have and how, how much you care for them and love them and pay attention to them, all the things we've talked about in this series. I don't want any person at this church, God, to think that they don't matter because they do, and they do not because of anything they've done, but because of what you've done, Lord. Take my words now, God, press them upon people's hearts, Use them, God, in a mighty way. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.